So let me start by telling you a story. This is something that happened in a music theory course when I was in college. So we were having a discussion around hearing and hearing damage. And my professor said two things that I thought were amazing. So the first uh, was my professor was describing a situation where somebody is in their car and they have one of those big elaborate sound systems with big subwoofers and everything all, all kitted out. And he was saying that the person in the car thinks that the music is at a moderate volume. They hear the high notes, they hear the low notes, they hear kind of the notes in between, and that all seems balanced to them. But in reality, they aren't truly hearing the bass notes because you can't really hear a note or a frequency until the sound wave has completed one full cycle. And he even made this motion in the air, the sound wave sort of going up and going down and back. And the argument was, because they're sitting so close to the speaker and the frequency is so low, they aren't really perceiving the sound. But you, uh, as a bystander across the street, might hear the bass really loud because you, the, it's completed its full cycle, so you're getting blasted with the full volume. Whereas you, you aren't really hearing the high notes because the bass is so much louder. So this was the first thing he said. The second thing he said, uh, we were talking about earphones, and he was saying how uh, you should only listen to music with big uh, cans, like over-ear cans like this. You shouldn't have earbuds in. And the reason is that an earbud creates a bit of a seal with your ear canal. And so as the, the sound is being pumped into your ear canal, it can't really escape, and the pressure builds up and it starts to damage your eardrum. And so you should only listen to music with things like this. Now, I thought that these two things were incredible because of how stupid they were. And it baffles me that a tenured professor of music theory at a major university could say something so ridiculously wrong about the fundamental nature of sound confidently in front of a classroom full of people. Now, I know that everyone who watches my videos is smart and attractive and hilarious and would never have this level of misconception, but just in case there's some confusion around this, I figure let's talk about the very simple nature of sound. And I figure this will be a good warm-up for me because it's been a hot minute since I've done a theory video, so we'll just start at the top. So let's imagine that we want to make a sound. And the way we'll do it is we'll have this little plate. You could say it's a metal plate. And then it's connected to some little shaft, a little metal shaft or something. And this is in air. So I'm going to draw some little air molecules all around it. Okay, that took a ridiculously long time. But these are air molecules. And if we're going to make a, a wave of sound, all we have to do is take this plate and shove it forward. Like that. So we'll imagine that it moves until it gets to, you know, like here-ish. And what that's going to do is it's going to take all of the air molecules that were in this space here, and it's going to shove them forward. So they get moved from here into this space. And that means that all the air molecules in this little zone are going to be all crammed up next to each other and that is that is pressure that is the the simple definition of pressure so what we've done is we've created this little zone of high pressure so from there the air molecules in this little zone will start running into the ones in front of them so the this little wave of pressure will start to move forward as they bang into these air molecules and then those will bang into these air molecules so we get this little stripe of pressure that just moves forward through the air. And that's it, that's a sound wave, that's all it is. So there's a few maybe interesting things that we can start to talk about here. So first, let's imagine that this sound wave is continuing to travel. So it's moving uh, away from where it started and it's starting to spread out. Okay, that was super annoying to draw too. But let's say that this sound wave, it's traveling, it's made it out to here and you can notice uh, one, it has spread out. Uh, that is the nature of sound. It does not travel through air like some little laser. As soon as it's 
begun, it starts to spread out uh, in this sort of spherical pattern. You know, I'm drawing this in two dimensions, but of course this is happening in 3D. So if you have a speaker and it makes a sound wave, imagine that sound wave emanating out sort of like a ball, okay? Just expanding in all directions. So if you think about it, just the basic physics of that, if there is a high amount of pressure here and this wave is just getting bigger and spreading, then the pressure is going to have to be a lot lower in the wave once it's made it out well, really, if, as soon as it goes anywhere, because the wave is getting bigger. And if we were to maintain the same amount of pressure in that wave, well, that adds up to way more energy. And we can't be somehow magically adding energy to this wave as it's expanding outward. So it expands and the, the uh, pressure inside the wave drops. Now we can describe the pressure in the wave uh, as amplitude. It's just the word that describes the pressure in the wave. So the amplitude right when the wave starts is going to be the highest. It's going to be relatively high. And then as it spreads, the amplitude of the wave drops. A couple more quick definitions here. So I drew this as this pressure wave or pressure front. But if you think about it, if we took the molecules of air and we shoved them forward into this zone, they would have to be somewhat more sparse right behind this high pressure zone right essentially a lot of the molecules have moved forward and crammed into this little zone so there's has to be fewer of them you know left over in this area behind it so i'm not going to draw this out because of super tedious but imagine that there's this low pressure zone here so we have high pressure zone low pressure zone behind it and then we're back to normal air so this zone the high pressure zone is just called compression this zone is called rarefaction. Now this word seems simple enough. Rarefaction sounds funny, but just think of uh, rare, like rarefied air. You know, there are fewer particles here, so they are more rare. So this is the rarefied part of the wave. So any sound wave would be more or less this profile, compression, rarefaction. So we can already start untangling a little bit of uh, my professor's nonsense here. If you just think about the basic physics of this, if you imagine this compression hitting an eardrum, it's going to hit the eardrum. And the whole nature of an eardrum is that it, it moves, right? So that compression slams into it. The eardrum moves this way a little bit. Then this compression will pass and then we get to the rarefaction. So there's this a little bit of a low pressure zone. And so that will actually bring the eardrum back in this direction. And then it will settle just in the, into its neutral position once we get back to the, the normal air. So that's what would happen if this sound wave hits the eardrum. And of course, this is exactly what is happening right now. I'm saying things into a mic. Your speakers are replicating that by doing exactly what our little metal plate is doing. It's sending off these pressure waves. They're hitting your eardrum and you're hearing stuff. Now, if we were to take this eardrum and we were to put it right here, right next to where this wave started, absolutely nothing is different. Of course, the pressure wave is going to hit the eardrum. It's going to move. If you get to the rarefaction, it's going to move back and then it'll get back to neutral. But the same thing is going to happen. It is completely nonsensical to think that the sound wave has to somehow cycle before the eardrum decides to react to what is simply an area of pressure. Now, one important thing here, as we said a second ago, uh, the pressure or the amplitude of the wave right here is pretty high and that drops as the wave is spreading out. So this will be louder to the eardrum. It's hitting it with higher pressure. That sort of seems obvious. If you put your ear next to somebody's mouth when they're yelling, it's really freaking loud. If they're you know across a field, you can barely hear them. Duh. And you can actually quantify how much quieter it is pretty easily. As I said, the sound wave, once it starts, it emanates out in three dimensions in this sort of spherical pattern. And I don't want to get into the math because it's not worth having to spend 10 minutes on that. But this, the amplitude of the wave as it's spreading out like this, the pressure, it falls off according to the inverse square law. All that means is that if you stood one foot away from the speaker, so say 
right here, you would hear the sound at, let's just say, 100 sound units. I actually don't really want to talk about decibels um, because that's this logarithmic thing and it's sort of complicated and not worth getting stuck on either. So let's just say we made up a unit. It's 100 of them. So you hear at one foot away, 100 loudness units. And then uh, let me make sure I don't write behind my picture. So let's say you went to uh, two feet away and you listen to that sound. You would hear it at 25. Nope, I really did write behind my picture. You would hear it at 25 of our made up loudness units. It seems like it would be half, but it's not because again, it's it's falling off very quickly, uh, exponentially getting quieter. So if you stand two feet away, you're gonna hear it at a quarter the loudness of right here. And by that same logic, if you went halfway, you stood at only uh, half a foot, you're hearing it at 400 loudness units. So you can kind of appreciate how quickly sound dissipates. So this also cuts against what my professor was saying that you know, the person across the street is getting blasted with sound, but the person in the car isn't hearing it. The sound fall off is extremely steep. And as you get farther away, it gets a lot quieter. Now there is a little bit of a caveat here that I do want to mention. Uh, this is what would happen if you were just in the open air, imagine floating above the earth up in the sky, there's just air surrounding you everywhere. It's going to radiate out like this in the real world. It kind of doesn't really work like that. Uh, you can imagine, say you have a, a speaker and it's in some kind of box. Maybe you're in a hallway or something, or I don't know. Well, let's say this is like some kind of long tube, like you're holding up one of those wrapping paper tubes against a speaker. So the sound waves are going to emanate off the speaker. They're going to spread out in that spherical pattern, but they're going to hit the walls of the tube and they're going to get reflected. It'll depend a little bit on what the material of the tube is. You know, if it's soft foam that may absorb a lot of it, but if it were something like that cardboard, it's going to reflect a lot. And so they're going to kind of bounce back into the middle and sort of bounce back and forth. And so at the end of it, if you're listening to it, uh, you're going to get the sound waves coming from the speaker, but you're also going to get a lot of sound waves that just got bounced around. So at the end of that tube, this sound can actually be pretty loud. And really any sound that gets made from a speaker or something or a car, there's the earth underneath you. There's buildings around you. There's all kinds of things that can reflect sound. Some are very reflective, like glass or smooth stone. Uh, some things like trees uh, or dirt that can be pretty absorbent. Uh, so the actual volume of the sound that you hear doesn't follow that inverse square law perfectly in the real world. And I just kind of wanted to mention that so you don't walk around with this non-realistic picture of sound volume. Okay, so something else here. Let's let's go back to this uh, pressure wave. Gorgeous, beautifully drawn diagram here. So as you can see, it's pretty annoying to try and represent uh, waves this way to try and draw out all little air particles. Uh, so a simpler way and a much more uh, kind of scientific way would be to graph this. So let's say... Uh, that we're gonna draw a graph of the sound pressure. I'll just do this little kind of freehand line. So let's say this line represents the, the neutral air pressure. It's, you know, this is what you get, but just normal air. And then as we encounter this, uh, this wave, this compression here, uh, we're gonna graph the pressure as going up. So the pressure is increasing while it's in this wave. Then as we come to the end of it, it's gonna go back down. And we get into this rarefied section where the air is thinner, so the pressure is actually going to drop beneath what it would be with just normal air. And then we're going to come to the end of that, and it'll come back to neutral. So we get this sort of squiggle that looks like this. Now, as I mentioned, my professor made this gesture in the air. Now, I don't know exactly what was in his brain or if he really did have this wrong or not, uh, but I think he may have thought that sound waves came out of speakers like these little squiggles and traveled towards you. And I actually think that uh, this is a pretty common misconception, that sound waves traveling through the air are somehow oscillating back and forth like this. And that's not totally crazy, because 
Usually when you see a sound wave represented on paper, like in a graph, it looks like this. You see this thing going up and then going down and then coming back, or you might see a whole bunch, you know, all in line like that. And so this kind of gives the impression that, okay, yeah, this is a sound wave. It's the squiggle. And if you go out to the ocean or a lake uh, and you looked at waves, those are probably the waves that we're all the most intuitively familiar with. From the side, that's what they look like. You know, waves are these things that go up and down. So there are two different types of wave. There is what's called a transverse wave, which is exactly what uh, ocean waves are. You know, from the side, they go up and down. They look kind of like this from a side profile. And then there are what are called longitudinal waves, which is what a sound wave is. And they technically don't always have to be longitudinal waves, but they almost always are. And I'll get to that in a second. So a longitudinal wave means that the sound wave is traveling in this direction. And the compression has also happened in this direction. The air molecules were taken from here and shoved into this area. So it's a longitudinal in the sense that the compression is following the, the direction of travel of the wave. This, this graph uh, gives you the impression that a sound wave is somehow wobbling back and forth, going up and down. Uh, longitudinal waves don't happen in the body of a fluid. Uh, so what I mean is that if you are like where you are right now, you're in atmosphere, there is air all around you. There is nothing you can do that is going to create a wave in the air where the air will go up and then somehow come back down and then go back up. It cannot wobble back and forth like this. Uh, this the same thing would be true if you were deep in the ocean. If you tried to somehow make a wave like you would see uh, on the surface near the beach, you can't do that. You push water up, it's just going to continue to go up. It can't somehow get sort of sucked back to where it came uh, they call that uh, like a shear stress and that can happen in a solid if you picture uh, a metal rod you, know, you could push part of the metal rod up and it'll sort of you know get moved back down and that transverse wave can travel down the metal transverse waves like i just said uh, in the ocean they can happen but they only happen at the surface. They happen at the boundary between the water and the air. And the reason that can happen is because gravity uh, sort of provides that almost sheer stress reaction where the water can be pushed up and then gravity pushes it back down. And so you are able to establish a transverse wave at the surface of a fluid, but not in a fluid. And certainly you can't make a transverse sound wave coming out of a speaker just in the air. So I believe that this is a common misconception by a lot of people. Uh, and the way to visualize or think about a sound wave is not like this. It is not some squiggle line. That is just a graph of the sound wave. It is something sort of like this mess. It is this, this band of pressure that is traveling through the air. Okay, so let's move into a very important piece of sound waves. And this is starting to inch closer to the idea of music. So in the example I was giving, let's just do a simplified version here. Let's say we have a speaker and it creates this little pressure wave that travels out, right? There's the rarefaction right behind the compression zone. If you heard this, it would sound, well, it sound kind of like a, like a finger snap or something. Not, this isn't a, a perfect example because you can't, can't really create something this pure, uh, with some kind of natural thing like me snapping my fingers, but it's pretty close. You can imagine that for the most part, there's just this wave of pressure hitting your eardrum. Now, if I asked you, hey, what, what note is this? What's that pitch? You really can't give much of an answer at all. You would probably say, that's more of a noise. That's not really a note. So in order to describe a pitch, we need to establish something called frequency. Now, frequency is a pattern in sound waves. It really doesn't make sense to look at a single sound wave like this one and try and describe its frequency. Frequency is how often something happens. So if it just happens once, you can't say a whole lot about it. So, okay, let's say we, we take our plate, whoops, we take our plate, we, we shove it forward, 
and then we move it back. And then we shove it forward again and move it back and forward and back and forward and back. And we just keep it moving back and forth. So what it's going to do is it's going to create, you know, a wave. Let's imagine that it's traveled to about here. And then behind that will be another wave and then another wave and so on. Now, if we assume that we're moving this in uh, regular intervals, so it's not, not moving fast and slow and whatnot, but it's relatively constant, then the distance between all of these waves should be the same. So we could put an eardrum, would work, but let's just say we're using a microphone, which is just a different kind of pressure sensor. So this is a, a mic. Right? And all it's really doing is sensing the pressure of the air as these waves travel by. So if we went, kind of went back to our, our graph system, yeah, this microphone would sense pressure going up, go up like this. It would go down when we get to the rarefaction zone and then go back up and then down and then up and then down, right? And that's kind of the sound wave that we're all pretty familiar with. So if we look at the distance between the peaks, or we could look at the distance between the troughs, same idea. Right, and assuming that this wave is constant or it's it's oscillating at a fixed rate, and this this distance is always the same, uh, then we could say, okay, this this sound wave has a particular frequency, or it's a series of sound waves that are all coming at regular intervals. Now it just turns out that our ears are very sensitive to this pattern in the sound waves. Uh, when these are hitting an eardrum or you know similar to this microphone you know that eardrum is going to going to move forward then it's going to move back and then forward and back and it just sort of oscillates at this regular rate same way that the microphone uh diaphragm would if we did this at let's say 440 times a second aka 440 hertz you would hear something uh like this Not the most pleasant sound in the world, but that's literally what that is, is these pressure waves hitting your ear 440 times a second. Now, if we took this plate and we moved it back and forth, but faster this time, then that would mean that the, the waves, the compression zones, are going to be much closer together. So if I, if I doubled this, this would be 880 hertz. And so you would hear a much higher frequency. The, uh, yeah, the graph would look more like that. And I'm not going to try to make that pretty because it's too hard. So you would hear higher frequency. You can move this slower and you get these very, you know, spaced out waves. You get a lower frequency. I don't have a sample of higher frequency, but here's a, here's one that's nice and low. This is... If you didn't hear anything just now, uh, you have bad speakers. That was, I think, like 37 hertz. So that your speakers were hopefully moving back and forth uh, about 37 times a second. These are very, very spaced out waves. So we have this idea of, you know, a high sound, very fast frequency, and then a low sound, very um, slow, spaced out compression waves. Simple enough, right? Okay, so there's something about frequency that I think is pretty unintuitive. But I want to try to explain it because it's pretty important to understand if you're really going to get your mind around frequency. So let's say we have our speaker again, and we're going to we're going to shove it forward and back really fast. We're going to do this at twenty thousand times a second, or twenty thousand hertz. This is uh, usually considered to be about the limit of human hearing. So real fast. So we shove this thing forward, it creates this wave, uh, and back, forward, back, forward, right? So it's, it's moving very fast, but it creates this pressure wave, and this pressure wave travels away from the speaker at uh, about 767-ish miles per hour. That's kind of the textbook uh, number for the speed of sound. In reality, this depends a little bit on air temperature and pressure, uh, the speed of sound changes depending on some of those variables. But given like normal conditions, it's about this. All right, so fine. Contrast that with, let's say, another speaker. And we're going to make a low frequency sound. We're going to make a sound that's only 20 hertz. 
So rather than 20,000 times a second, we're going to move this back and forth only 20 times. So this is a little bit lower than the sound I just played you. So you would kind of think, considering that we're moving this forward at such a leisurely pace in comparison with this one, that the sound wave we make would uh, kind of drift off of here pretty slowly, right? You'd think, well, we didn't push the air all that fast, uh, so you would expect this to be much slower. But in fact, it is the same. 667-ish miles per hour. And I personally find this a little bit hard to understand intuitively, but it is the nature of a fluid where pressure propagates throughout that fluid at a constant speed. So the molecules are shoving into each other and it takes about that long for that high pressure zone to propagate to the molecules surrounding it. And it actually doesn't matter how fast this speaker was moving in the first place. So what that means is that even though we're only doing this 20 times a second, these sound waves are just flying off of here really fast. Same speed as these, but again, these are these are happening very, very frequently. So they wind up being very close together. These, it, uh, because they're flying off of here at the speed of sound, uh, you get a lot of distance between this compression wave before the speaker comes around again and makes another one, right? And we'll say this is our second one, right? So we get lots and lots of space. In fact, uh, in normal atmospheric air, a sound at uh, 20,000 hertz, the distance between the sound waves would be about half an inch-ish, which kind of gives you a sense of how, one, that these things are moving very fast, that if you were just listening to it, you would get hit with 20,000 of these in one second, even though they're a half inch apart, right? But down here at about 20 hertz, uh, these can be around 50 feet or more, 50, 60 feet or something. So there's this is traveling awfully far before the next one is, is coming behind it. So this is kind of further evidence that something was really weird about my professor's explanation with the, uh, the car, the sound system, because by this logic, we already established that it makes no sense to think that a, a sound wave needs to somehow complete a cycle before its pressure is going to have an effect on your eardrum. That makes no sense, but even if it did, uh, it would take about 50 or 60 feet for that cycle to be complete if we're talking about this very low frequency sound. So you would need to be very far away from the car to even hear it. Just being you know, on the street or on the sidewalk wouldn't be enough. You should, if this magical situation were true, you wouldn't be able to hear the sound either. It wouldn't complete that first cycle until it's behind you. So extra dumb is what I'm saying. But I want to highlight the way that it doesn't really matter how fast you're oscillating a speaker. Sound, this pressure wave, propagates through a medium at the same speed. And it's worth appreciating how big the wavelengths actually are for a low frequency sound versus a high frequency sound. Okay, so let me describe what is actually happening when you're hearing this you know, person blasting their stereo system and why you really do mostly hear just the bass sounds and not the high pitch sounds. Because this is actually, I think, kind of an interesting thing to think about. And you'll notice this, you know, if you're laying in your bedroom at night, sleeping or trying to go to sleep, somebody rolls past your house, you just hear the bass. It's like your walls will rattle and you hear this thudding sound, but you, you can't tell what song is playing. You can't hear any of the high notes. So there really is something happening here. So let's consider our high frequency wave again. And we're going to plot it out, you know, pressure rising, falling, rising, falling. Uh, remember, this is not what a sound wave looks like. This is literally just a graph of the pressure of a sound wave over time. Right. But OK, we have this high frequency wave. So, you know, peak, valley, peak, valley, peak, valley. Now you consider that, OK, at the peak of this wave, the air is hitting its highest amount of compression. Right. And you could start to think about the energy that's in this wave by looking at, uh, we'll say the area under the curve. What I mean is that if we're trying to think about the total amount of energy imparted to this wave. It's really a function of how compressed is the air, you know, how much pressure did we put in there, and then how long is it compressed for? So at the start here, right, the, the beginning of the wave, the air is neutral, it's not compressed at all. So we'd say that there's no extra energy that has been put into the air. 
And as the pressure starts to rise, we'll say, okay, there's a little bit of energy here and there's more and there's more. And so we hit this peak where we hit the maximum pressure, but this doesn't last for very long. Pretty quickly, it returns back to this zero energy state. So we could say, okay, well, we put, you know, this much compression and it lasted about this long, one twenty thousandth of a second for this, this compression. And then we could look at the valley where the air becomes, uh, less compressed, you know, less compressed even than the neutral air. This is the rarefaction place or rarefaction part of the wave, right? And we could look at the area under the curve here. Say, okay, there's area or there's a energy also imparted to the wave in the sort of negative piece of it. And then here again, right? So we could kind of total up the amount of energy in the wave this way. I realize this is a little bit of a sort of hand wavy explanation for uh, <laughs> the energy in a wave, but hopefully it intuitively makes a little bit of sense. So let's say we wanted to put more energy into this high frequency wave. Well, if we're going to keep the frequency the same, the only thing we can do is just crank up the amplitude. Say, okay, let's, let's get that speaker really moving, really pushing forwards and backwards really hard, creating a lot of compression. So that would just look like uh, the same, again, the same frequency. So it's happening at the same rate, but it just gets much higher, right? The amplitude is much higher. And then it's going to dip down much lower, it's sort of a reaction, and then higher, and then lower, and so on. Okay, again, beautiful, beautiful sine wave here, up and down, whatever. So you could look at this and say, okay, well, if we were trying to figure out how much energy is in here, we total up the area under the curve and say, all right, that's more. We definitely have more energy here. So there's, there's more traveling inside this sound wave. It's going to feel louder to your ear because there's a higher amount of compression hitting your eardrum and displacing that eardrum more. But if you think about it, it's actually a pretty difficult to push the pressure up all that much higher because we don't get a lot of time to do that. The pressure has to return back to neutral very quickly, you know, in one twenty thousandth of a second. So you picture a speaker, right? Like a little tweeter that you would see in a car and a stereo. This tiny little speaker, the only way to, comp if it's moving at 20,000 oscillations a second, the only way to compress the air more is to move it farther. You know, it's oscillating back and forth just as fast. So we can make a low volume sound by moving it out to there and then back to here. We can make a higher volume sound by moving it all the way out to here and then all the way back to there, right? But this thing is like really stretching its limits of what it can do. It's like hitting the physical limitations of a speaker. And there's just, simply put, there's limits on how much energy we can put into this high frequency wave, because again, it has to return back to neutral so fast. Okay, compare that to a low frequency wave. Like I said, the high frequency wave, uh, the wavelength can be in air, literally about half an inch. That low frequency wave can be around 50 or 60 feet. So I can't even begin to draw that to scale on this screen, but it's, you know, you could barely even see the curve of the wave if you were trying to compare that to this. You know, you have this huge zone where the pressure of the wave, it can rise and rise and rise and get really, really high before it begins to drop back down. And if you were to try to total up the area under that curve, that could be gigantic. You could have so much energy contained inside that wave. It's a mountain compared to a speed bump in terms of the compression and how long it's there for. Now this kind of makes intuitive sense if you've actually looked at a car stereo or even a home stereo. The tweeter is this tiny little thing up at the top making the high pitched sounds. The subwoofer is gigantic. It can be, you know, 12 inches across, 18 inches across, from some of these really absurd ones, is this gigantic surface. And if you watch it move, uh, even though it's oscillating back and forth relatively slowly, it's moving out very far and coming back very far. You can see it's like traveling an inch or so. It is really pushing the air uh, and it's doing a lot of it in this big, large area. And they take way more power you need a much bigger amplifier and big thick cables running to it. Like you have to pump a lot of energy in there in order to generate this wave. Now, there's something uh, kind of on top of this that makes this uh, situation worse in that our hearing is more sensitive to the high pitch sounds. We're much more able to hear this because we hear through that tiny little eardrum 
that's able to pick up these sound waves. So it it's very happy to move back and forth very quickly for a high frequency sound. But these gigantic waves that are you know just coming every 50 or 60 feet, uh, this little eardrum is just a lot less sensitive to this. So in order for us to perceive the same volume of sound with this low frequency sound, you just need a much higher amplitude wave. And again, because of the nature of the wave, because you're compressing the air for such a long amount of time, you can pack so much energy into that wave. Okay, so the original question was, why is it that you can hear the bass so loudly? It doesn't really make sense just to say there's more energy in the wave because it still doesn't explain why you're you're hearing it and not the high-pitched one. But the reasoning for that has to do with the way energy gets absorbed. If we were just out in the open air and you heard sound playing from across the street and there was no obstacles, no nothing, you would roughly hear the high-pitched sounds at about the same volume as the low-pitched sounds. You know, they're going to fall off according to the inverse square law, and that's going to apply to both of them. So even though they'll be much quieter from where you're standing than if you were right next to it, it still should be roughly the same volume. But in the real world, and in this example, we're talking about somebody in a car, uh, things are not out in the open air. They're in a box. They're in a box made of plastic and metal and glass and carpet and so on. So with this high frequency wave, these tiny little back and forth oscillations. Again, there's not actually all that much energy in this peak. And when this energy runs into, let's say a piece of foam, uh, like what is lining uh, underneath the carpet most of the time in a car, you know, there's that foam, let's say there's some, I don't know, block of foam here. Uh, that energy is gonna hit the foam. The foam is gonna deform a little bit, kind of react to that pressure wave hitting it and it's just going to kind of absorb the energy it sucks it up and so this wave it hits it and it's pretty much gone it just gets absorbed by the foam but let's say we have this giant wave with all of this compression and energy in it right this hits the piece of foam and the foam deforms again like it tries to absorb a little bit but it hardly puts a dent in it right it maybe takes a little off the top of all the energy in this wave and the rest of it is just going to roll right through because that little bit of deformation is not nearly enough to absorb all the energy that we've pumped into this giant base wave but there's a little bit more to it than that if you think about it you know okay so maybe this doesn't absorb it but we're talking about a box you know a car is sealed more or less so even if it takes more uh, more deformation or more absorption to try and kill the wave off, how is it that it's still able to escape this airtight container? Okay, so let's, again, here's big bass woofer. Okay. Big low frequency sound waves, but how are they getting out? So if you take, let's say a piece of glass piece of glass is pretty heavy. I don't know if you've ever picked one up, but they are. It's this big chunk of mass. And when that low frequency wave hits it, or sorry, when the high frequency wave hits it, you know, this little guy, okay, this energy hits the glass. It might be a little bit absorbed. Again, it's easier to absorb. It might be reflected too. But the part that, that is absorbed, you know, hitting this glass surface, it's going to push on the glass. But it's not going to push very hard and it's not going to push very long. It's only going to be pushing for, you know, one twenty thousandth of a second, or I guess technically half of that because one twenty thousandth is like the time it takes to go from here all the way to here, but whatever. Anyway, it's going to push on it. It's going to try to move it forward. And then almost immediately, it's going to be a low pressure zone trying to move it back. So this glass, it's big, it's heavy. It has a lot of mass. So if you accelerate it forward, uh, it's going to take a while for that mass to kind of slow down and reach a stop and then begin to reverse and come back. Think about it like uh, the, the low string on a bass guitar. You pluck that string, that string is big, 
and heavy, and so it moves in one direction, it takes a while to stop, and then it has to move slowly back in the other direction, and so it oscillates back and forth slowly. That's the point, is that it is designed to make low frequency sounds. You compare that to like the high E string on a guitar, there's not a lot of mass there, so you, you push that thing forward, you know, it's able to decelerate very fast and then move in the other direction very fast, and so it's pretty happy to vibrate really quickly. So in this case, the glass really does not want to vibrate back and forth at a high frequency in the same way that a bass guitar string doesn't want to vibrate back and forth at a high frequency either. So it's not going to move much. It just, it, the physics of it don't really line up. But you get this big low frequency wave, right? So you're hitting, uh, you're hitting the, the pane of glass with a bunch of pressure. You're pushing on it. You're pushing on it for a while. You're able to actually get it to move out a little bit. And then it decelerates, begins moving in the other direction, and that could coincide with the rarefaction part of the wave. Essentially, this pane of glass is willing to resonate at this frequency. So that means that this is now functioning just like our speaker did. It's pushing on the air outside of it, and then it's pulling back and pushing, pulling back. So this base subwoofer is essentially turning the glass and the steel and everything in the car into its own speaker. It's resonating and sending sound waves out of it. And this is why, uh, if you've ever tried to install this kind of thing in your car, uh, as soon as you start cranking up the bass, everything starts to rattle. You get all kinds of noises and rattles and nonsense uh, because everything is resonating in response to this low frequency. And that's why when this person rolls down the street, it actually sounds ridiculous and terrible because all you hear is the rattling of their trunk. So those several things together are why a low frequency wave, uh, one, it has a lot more energy to start with. You kind of need that uh, because we just don't hear it quite as well. So you need a lot more energy uh, and then it's much harder to absorb the energy in the wave and it is much more able to resonate the surfaces of the car or of your bedroom walls uh, and send the sound outwards so uh, it's really a perception difference in that the person in the car they are getting blasted with super loud bass but they're also getting blasted with super loud uh, high frequency sounds so to them it sounds balanced for you outside the car you're hearing the bass at a much lower volume than they are but you just can't hear the high sounds at all, so it just sounds like a bunch of bass. That's why the car thing happens. Now, really quick, let's discuss the, uh, the ear canal thing. That one's very simple and should be super obvious at this point. If you understand what a sound wave is, let's say we have a speaker, like a, you know, an earbud. That's an earbud, whatever. Uh, and then this is the uh, your ear canal with your eardrum somewhere in there, right? Let's even say it has a perfect seal. Doesn't matter. It's creating sound waves. It is not pumping air into the ear canal. All it's doing is creating a zone of high pressure and then a zone of lower pressure. The total amount of air molecules in this ear canal have not changed at all. You're just creating a little zone of pressure and a little zone of low pressure. And that's going to hit your eardrum. So there is no concept of pumping air into this ear canal and somehow building up pressure. You're just disturbing the air like this. Nothing to do, or there's nothing more dangerous or less dangerous about wearing earbuds versus headphones. So that is my very basic explanation of sound and sound waves. I hope that in all of that, it somehow made more sense to you than it made to my college theory professor. Um, real quick, I'm just kind of, thinking about the coming months, I would really love to just get back in the groove of doing these theory videos. Uh, and my thinking is that I'd like to just sort of take it from the top. Uh, you know, it's been so long that I'm just gonna, I wanted to start with the really basic stuff like sound waves. I'd like to move into some other basic physical properties of sound like harmonics and why a, a string makes a sound or a vibrating column of air makes a sound and how that works. Uh, and then talk about you know, the relationship between notes and why things are tuned the way they are with the, the 12 pitches in an octave, stuff like that. I kind of just want to pretend that like the other stuff didn't happen and we're just going to start fresh and take a new look at music theory. So I'm not really sure where we're headed, but uh, please let me know what your feelings are. And I'm happy to hear comments on the setup because this is totally new. I'm trying to come up with something that's a little bit easier to set up and break down for me. But anyway, 
thank you for watching, especially if you made it this far. It's good to be back. I missed everybody. See you next time.